Yeah. Do, so why don't we have a look at that? Yeah. So this stuff's due tomorrow now. Okay. So this last one's got some ramps and stuff on it too. It's right there. Um. All right, so, so what you want to be doing on this thing is uh, you want to find the weights, okay? Because when you're doing this F equals MA stuff, The weights are forces, okay? So you want to be doing that. So we got two blocks on that uh, cable, and then they go over the pulley. They're on either side of the ramp. Um, so two kilograms by gravity gets you 19.6 newtons, and six kilograms by gravity gets you 58.9 newtons, okay? All right, so what you want to do then is you want to uh, find the, uh, the friction, and we've got two different things we're going to do. We're going to look at impending motion. Now, impending motion, what we do is we use static friction. What we're testing there is if there's enough force to break the object loose, and that's static friction. And then the, uh, when you have motion itself, that's kinetic friction. Typically, kinetic friction is less than static friction. That's the typical thing. All right, now you've got kind of a standard thing that you do here with, with ramps when you're working through those. Um, and the standard thing is the cosine of the ramp angle is times the weight will get you the force normal to the ramp, and the sine of the ramp angle times the weight will get you the force parallel to the ramp. That, that's, it's always that way, so, so you, know, you, you want to uh, remember that, okay? So, um, and you know, I could, what do we got here? Let's, okay. Um, so there you go. There's the, there's an example of it, and this is this is always this way. So you know it's kind of, and it has to do with uh, kind of the building a right triangle, and then you end up with this kind of configuration. So you've got the ramp angle in this example. This is not even doing our homework directly, but it's kind of how it, how it works. But 34 and 56, so the, if the ramp angle's 34, what you can do is you can draw a perpendicular up from the flat surface straight up. That'll get you a right triangle. This will be 90 minus 34, and that'll get you a 56 right there. You can then go, I think, what are called opposite angles and get the 56 degree angle. Notice that we're using it slightly differently. Um, uh, maybe not. You know, we're, we're getting the angle between the vertical weight and the angled ramp there, which is opposite this 156. So this also is 56 right there. And then what we can do is take 90 minus 56 and get back to 34, which is this angle right here. So that's kind of the, you know, the sequence of, of getting all that figured out. So what that means is if you take the weight times the cosine of 34 uh, of that ramp angle, what you get is the component of weight normal to the ramp, and then the weight times sine of 34 will get you the component parallel to the ramp. Okay, and it's just always that way. And we seem to run into things on inclines and ramps, so you know that's worth remembering. Okay, so so we good with that. Oh, let's see. I didn't think I wanted to do that, did I? Yeah, you didn't want to do that. Okay, so let's have a look now at, at our problem, you know, and how we would approach it then. Um, all right. So in our problem, then, you would do the same thing. Even though that ramp angle is quite extreme, 63 degrees, it's the same relationship. So you need to find the normal force, um, which would be the force of the ramp on the block, and then you multiply that by the appropriate coefficients of friction to get the frictional forces. All right. 
Now you can handle this problem two different ways. It just depends on, on how you might want to do it. Now the first thing I want to look at is impending motion. Okay, I want to see is this thing going to move? Now if it's going to move, um, there has to be a net force dragging it down the ramp. Now if you do this, you can treat A and B as one system if you like. Now you don't have to, but you can do it that way. Now what will happen when you do that is, is the tension in the cable will become an internal force to the system. Okay, So that does simplify it a little bit. So what you're going to have then is you're going to have kind of a free body diagram as being both objects. So the free body diagram is essentially like that. And now this does uh, have one little thing on it, and that motion you kind of have to define, not really as a moment, though it kind of looks that way. You're looking at moment as being kind of a clockwise motion. So B is going down the ramp, A is moving up. Those would all be positive kind of things. So what you would have then would be sum of F. And what I did here, I just looked at the static friction and then summed up the forces acting on those blocks. Okay, so anything that made it go clockwise, I called positive, and it looks like one thing making it go clockwise is 52.4 newtons. I think you're going to subtract off a couple other things, and when you do that, you come up with 26.4 newtons. Okay, and if that's the case, that thing's uh, moving. Okay, so using static friction, we have a net force on that system that's going to make the whole system move. Um, it's not clockwise really isn't, you know, I'm a little leery of that because clockwise is a rotational thing, but B down, A up. Yeah, question there? Are the tension forces on both blocks the same? Yeah, yeah, the tensions would be the same. As long as that pulley is small and frictionless, you can assume that. Okay. Okay. Other other questions? Right. So so this approach ignores the uh, the tension. That's what it does. Okay, because that's internal to the system that's been defined. All right. All right, now um, what you would do on the next step to find that acceleration would be to take this stuff right here and just move it down with the one exception. you got to change to kinetic friction is what you got to do there, okay? Here it's static friction up above. The next step, it's kinetic friction. And then it's not equal to, to, you're not just summing up the forces any longer. What you're doing, you're doing F equals MA to solve this thing out. So that would be the next, uh, the next step on this thing would be to do that. So what you'd want to do then, yeah, as I, as I have there, it's F equals MA. So you're going to sum up the forces as you did in the step above. You are going to use a different friction, the kinetic friction, and then you're going to equate that to the total mass of the system times A, and that will get you the acceleration at 3.44. Okay, yeah, question there? The mass, the usual total mass of the system. Yeah, because everything's accelerating. You know, this one's different than the previous one. On the previous one, which we did yesterday, only that small block was, or actually was more massive, but the one block was the only thing accelerating. Both of them are now because they're tied together. So, so. The general rule is you include the mass of the stuff that accelerates. In this case, it's both blocks. Okay. For um, the stuff you have wired out for the two um, uh, weights and newtons, what is that? Oh, I'm sorry, below the two weights and uh, newtons? The, like the first white block you have um, under the two uh, weights. This thing? Yeah. That. Oh, okay. Um, well, that's a good question. Oh, I think that's when I did the trig to get the weight of... Uh, be broken up into components normal and parallel to the ramp. I think that's oh, what I was doing there, sine and cosine. Basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is that, that 26.4 newtons tension? Well, that's a total force is what it is. It's kind of the sum of all the forces. It's, it's the 52.4 minus this and minus that because they're, they're restricting motion. Mm -hmm. So it's not really tension, I don't think. It's a net force on the whole system. Okay. And there's other ways you could do that. I mean, you could say F equals MA and find, well, actually not with static friction. So I'm just summing up the forces and making sure there's a positive force making the thing move is what I'm doing. Okay. 
Other questions? All right, now another way you could do this, and you would do this if you wanted to know what the tension is, especially. Now, this method that I show here is pretty quick and straightforward. Um, the one thing about this is if you want to know what the tension is, it won't work, okay, because you're, you're considering the tension to be an internal force. If you want to know what the tension is, you've got to break the system up into two pieces. And so this is an alternate approach to the same problem. The one time you might have to use this approach is if you want to find what the tension is. Okay. So that other method where A and B are one system, I'm finding only the acceleration. The tension is internal. If I want to know what the tension is, I, I would use two free body diagrams. All right. So what I would do on that would be to create those free body diagrams that you see. I've got one for A and another one for B. T is now an unknown. Now notice, you know, again, I answered that question just a minute earlier, but you know, both T's are the same. They're, you know, the tension on one is the tension on the other. And that's the thing that links them together, really. So if you're going to do impending motion using statics, <coughs> you start with A, and you're going to use statics for impending motion. You're going to go sum of Fy is zero, and that will lead you to the you know, pretty simple fact that the tension is equal to the weight of A. That's for statics. Then you can take that tension and apply it there on the free body diagram for B. And then I just summed up the forces and got the same net force. It's 26.4. So motion occurs. That's what the statics does. So you've determined then that the motion occurs. For part two there, you've got A, uh, block A with the weight down, the tension up. But now instead of uh, static equilibrium, you're going to have a dynamic situation. So I, sh I show the acceleration there on it. And then I do the same thing for B. So the free body diagrams change just a little bit. What's being added to them from the statics is the accelerations. Okay, So they're on there now. So what I would do for each would be to write up an equation F equals MA for both blocks. And I'm going to have commonality. See that A and A are going to equal each other, and T and T are going to equal each other. So they're, you know, they're um, constants, or not constants, they're equal in, in both equations. Okay. So I can go ahead and then write up an equation for, for each of those, and then I'm going to have... Um, I can equate them together, basically, because I know the tensions equal each other. And then I can go ahead and, and use that to equate the two, un, two equations together and solve for the acceleration. For the one on B, would you have to use the normal force and the uh, For the one on B, I didn't show the normal force. I, I, it was kind of crowded. And you know, I, technically, I should have. You know, um, But the friction is what matters. Because the, the, the normal force is perpendicular to the motion, so it doesn't affect it uh, directly. Of course, it affects what the friction is, but we've already done that up here and found what the friction is. Okay, so so you'd include the friction certainly, but you wouldn't need to include the normal force in that equation. All right. So so we doing all right with that? That's the deal with that one. So I kind of see these as two-step processes. The first step is to get those nice free body diagrams with forces and accelerations, and then I just do the F equals MA to those diagrams. This is how I look at it. Okay. And that's, that's the approach I take. Okay. All right, so we're good. All right. Why don't we, uh, before we get into the next bit here, let's just make something up here. Um, you can just draw this up if you would. Let's put a block on a spring here. Something like that. And let's push on the block. Um, I 
Okay, I have to do this in my head here too. 19, 20. Hang on here. No, I don't want to do that. I'll make it 1.8. Sorry about that. I'm just kind of making this one up. So I have to think that's through. So what do we got? 70.4. Okay. All right. So there you go. So we've got a, uh, <laughs> let's everybody will label this. That's a spring. Okay. So we're all clear on that. Um, all right, it's unstretched length is 1.8 meters. Um, we've got K is 30 newtons per meter. Let's go mu, the kinetic frictional coefficient is 0 0.10. Is that going to be all right? Yeah, that should be okay. Let's you draw up a free body diagram of that, okay? So those of you online, once you go ahead and do that, then when you're, I'll, and just, uh, I'll pause the recording just so you don't have a bunch of data here. So just, just pause the recording too and drop your free body diagram. And then after you've done that, start it up again, okay? All right, y'all get into something like that? I, I just kind of ran through that. I didn't really prep this or anything, so. Is that uh, so? What I'm doing there, I've got the, I, I found the normal force, which I had to include that sine 30 of 70 on it. So that got me 54.62. Then times the coefficient of friction is 5.46 for the friction. Is that all right? No, actually, I'm asking you because I just ran through this. I don't. Is that, is that checking? Yeah, I good? Okay, good deal. Thanks. And then uh, I want the spring force. It's being compressed by 0.4 meters, so multiply that by the 30, and I get 12 newtons. Okay, is that okay? So that and that's basically the free body diagram. Now, for so we got any questions on that? We doing all right with that? What's what, what's that? Yeah, I got the 12 on there, or the 5.46, 5.46. Okay, so friction. So we we good with that? All right. Okay. All right, now, so we're good. So for dynamics, now I want to include the acceleration. So which way is it going to accelerate, left or right? Yeah, because I got that 70 push, and I'm going to have to multiply that by cosine 30, right? But still, that's, that's going to overcome the friction in the spring, right? So I, I would put the acceleration on there. I'm getting pretty crowded here, and my pen won't work. And I had various crises going on here, but I guess we're doing all right. There we go. So A. So that's that's a dynamics free body diagram, all right. And see, I, um, I'm always trying to kind of figure out ways to get this across to people, you know, to help them learn this. But that's I just did all my thinking right there. Okay, I, I just turned that uh, picture with a spring and friction and all that. I, I went through all my mental processes and got a, just a force diagram. That's all I want out of this thing is a force diagram. Once I got that, I'm done thinking, and I'm just going to do F equals MA, and there's rules I follow on the F equals MA. But don't, you know, I remember when I was learning this stuff, I overthought stuff sometimes. You know, I started thinking about cause and effect and this and that. And of course, you know, I understand that you're learning new stuff, you know, but, but this is the approach that I take. And I've taken this in classes, you know, that were new to me that I didn't know real well, and it seemed to work pretty well. I mean, kind of discipline your thinking a little bit is, I guess, what I'm saying here. All right, so the next little bit here, once I've done that, I'm like I say, I'm done thinking. Now I'm just going to go sum of F equals MA. All right. Okay, and all I got to remember on this is I just look at that diagram, the stuff that I would put in a statics equation, forces and weights that goes on the left, and the MA goes on the right, and I got to watch the signs. That's all I got to remember about this equation. But I'm not thinking anymore. I'm not analyzing 
I'm not doing anything. I'm just throwing forces in that equation. That's all I'm doing, okay? So why don't you do that and come up with the acceleration? <laughs> That's what I got um, from my equation there. So this 30 cosine times 70 minus 12 minus 5.46 divided by 2. Is that 21.6? Pretty high, isn't it? You okay with that? But again, I, I do my thinking when I make the diagram. Once I got that, I'm just applying those rules. Static stuff on the left, dynamic stuff on the right, watch your signs. That's it, okay? That's how I do that. And I don't, you might have learned this differently in physics. I don't know, you know, I don't know how it's taught there. But this, you know, this method works pretty well for me. It's consistent if I just apply it, okay? Yeah. And, and so we got any questions on this stuff? Okay. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 21 point, oh, not Newton's. I don't know what I'm doing there. My bad. Meters per second squared, I think. That's an acceleration. There we go. There. Right. Um, so, so that's a little bit on, on this F equals MA stuff. Um, now we're going to do some more of this, but that's the basics of it there. Okay. Now, one other thing I just wanted to mention was that one homework problem that I handed back. Um, I wanted you to show those components of acceleration. It was that spiral problem. This is a while back, but I've handed it back already, you know. Um, why don't we just look at that real quick so we're all good on that. Um, yikes, that's a lot of stuff on here, isn't it? Um, so, so what I was looking for on this one was for you to mark where, uh, to put your, your labels on the object because that's what's accelerating. 
Now the vo velocity had a positive radial component. Now that would go out from the origin. Notice the origin is here, so that would extend out from the origin. The uh, transverse component would go that way. They're at 90 degrees. Okay, that's what I was looking for on that. Now just incidentally, if you look at the vector combination of those two, what, what's going on there? See the vector addition of the two would get you a vector that's tangent to that curve, right? That, that's, that's how these relationships work, okay? All right. Now, on the acceleration, you had a negative radial component. It's going inwards, and then the other component would be perpendicular to that, okay? So that's all I was looking for on this. The things I'd emphasize here is that the components are at right angles to one another, what you start with is the radial going in and out towards the origin. That's what it's doing. And then um, the other thing with that is that then the transverse component is perpendicular to the radial. That, that's how that coordinate system works. Okay. So I just wanted to mention that. So any questions on that? All right, let's, um, let's kind of keep going with this F equals MA stuff, but let's look at uh, motion that's uh, curved, all right? So let's look at, at what happens when we, have, when we apply this analysis to objects that are moving in, in a curved path, all right? So it's the same stuff. You're going to do F equals MA. It's just generating the free body diagrams different. Okay, curve linear motion, usually I use normal and tangential accelerations, and I analyze them using F equals MA. So it, what it affects isn't the F equals MA analysis, it affects the generation of a free body diagram. So, um, and I don't think I really made much of a separate note page about this. I, I think I just got some examples in one or two, maybe one. I think it's two. Yeah, it's two. It's 330 is where it's going to be at. So what I've got there is a collar slides on the circular track shown. Find the normal force exerted on the collar by the track and the rate of change of velocity of the collar. Okay. I've got the speed of the collar shown there um, as it goes around that circular track. I should have the radius of the track. Yeah, it's called out there. Mass of the collar and all that. Um, all right, so, so that's the information we've got here. So, um, so what we have here, we kind of zoom in, is we've got the circular track, we've got the collar on the circular track, and then we've got this thing, uh, I would assume it's accelerating. Um, okay, what I just underlined, if you're going to translate that into a, a simple uh, dynamics term, what would that be? Yeah, wh which one? It's accel because yeah, acceleration, rate of change of the velocity. Okay, the velocity is changing. That's acceleration. Which way does what is it? Which way does it act? So this is an a a sub what? Yeah, t tangential. Okay, because remember, a, a changing velocity is in the tangential direction. That's you driving in a car on a curve, like you're heading back to Corvallis on. Um, 34 and you're stepping on the gas. You're, you're going faster. Your speedometer is changing. That's what a sub t is, okay? All right. Now, so that's a sub t. Now, we also, what the other component of acceleration, whoops, <laughs> other component of acceleration, what's, what's it doing? Or is there another? Or? Yeah, where is it going? What's it doing? Yeah, it's doing that, right? And that's the normal. In physics, I think he called that centripetal, I think. We call it normal. So whenever something's going in a 
in a curved path, that's what you want to consider about it. Those two things, okay? And, and get used to this wording, the rate of change of velocity or something like that. The velocity is changing at a rate of something like that. That means tangential is what it means, okay? All right, so what we want to do here is we're going to want to find um, what that is. We're also going to want to find the normal force of the track on the... Um, track on the, the collar, all right? So the normal force would be doing that, right? And, uh, oh, what else do we got going on here? We've got, what else do I need to put on this collar to get this thing thrown up? Friction, yeah. Friction is going to be tangential. When things are on a curved path like this, the tangential acceleration, of course, and the friction is tangential. And then what else? We got, got the mass of the collar, so I think we got a weight, okay? So that's kind of the free body diagram we're dealing with. We got to fill in some details on it, but that's the basics of it right there, okay? So any any questions on that stuff? Yeah. Why is the normal force up versus down? Um, let's see. So the question is, why is the normal force up versus down? By up, I, I assume you mean in the normal direction. I mean upright, <coughs> okay, correct? Yeah. Why is it instead of going the other way? Um, okay. It's that. Well, first off, I, I don't know, and I could have guessed. I, I guessed. All right. So for starters, I don't for sure know which way the normal is going. It could have been doing that also. And now I'm making a pretty good guess for two reasons, though. One is it's got to hold the that darn thing. <laughs> I was trying to erase the other thing and it grabbed the one I didn't want. Um, okay, and what what it's doing here is it's um, it's got to hold the weight up for one thing. You know, the, if if it weren't for that that track, the the collar just fall. So the, the normal has to push up to hold that thing up, but also it has to create this acceleration too. So between those two things, I'm pretty darn sure that's going up right in this case. But I guess the, the you know, the theoretical answer is I don't really know. I just guess, and if I if I guess wrong, I get a negative answer, and there's no harm done in a negative answer. I just turn it around. Yeah, question. There. So are we defining that the track is static from a static um, <laughs> yes, and thanks. Um, that's a very important point, and that's something. So, and, and that's something that I've kind of become more aware of being clear on that in how I word things and how I draw them. Um, Until you do the weight, I assume that it's flat. Yeah, you're right. Okay, and there's nothing in there to indicate that. So, thanks. I'm very, I'm very uh, aware of that on tests. So, what'll happen on a test? And th this is an older copy, you know, from years ago when I didn't. Wasn't thinking about that that so much, but now what I'll do, I'll do this up. I'll put an up arrow if it's going that way. And I also I'll use keywords. And why don't we just this came up? So this is in the vertical plane. That's another term I'll use. So in the vertical plane. So that's that's a kind of a key phrase. You know, I try and call these out so you know what they mean. So you'll see it, uh, something like that. In the vertical plane means like kind of along a wall or something like that. This is older copy, so I didn't get that in there. But the new stuff will have an, an up arrow if it's in the vertical plane. And also we'll have that expression. And now I'll contrast that with the horizontal plane, which is like a flat table. And it, it, you're right, it affects how gravity, the weight, and how that affects everything. Okay. And so that was ambiguous on this one. So, so we good with that? Okay. And, and the significance of that was this term, this weight right here, and determining which way the weight acts. Okay, right there. Okay. All right, so what I want to do is kind of get this diagram worked out a little bit. I want to... Uh, fill it in with, with as much numerical information as I can. I mean, the FN I don't know and the AT I don't know, but I can find the weight and I can find the friction, so I want to go ahead and do that. So the weight is just going to be the, um, 
the 1.4 kilograms times the 9.81 meters per second squared. So mass times gravity gets me weight. It's 13.73. And then I break that up into uh, components is what I did there. So I just figured I'd draw a free body diagram with, uh, with the components of weight. I, I, on this one, I decided to put all the free body diagram uh, based on components aligned with the normal and tangential axes. So I just did all the trig in the free body diagram on this one, okay. Now, one thing that I did here, I'll kind of call your attention to, is this little uh, angle diagram here. Right there. So I've got that 41 degree angle. I pulled that down from the circle. When I draw a horizontal then, I've got parallel angles, so the other angle below is 41 as well. Then that's the angle between the normal axis and the horizontal. Okay, I know that these two lines are the normal and tangential axes. That's a 90 degree angle. So what I can do is take 90 minus 41, and I'll get the 49 that you see there. And then the one that I'm really after is the one below that, the 41 degrees below that, because I've got another right angle here shown there with these red kind of squiggly lines here. And that's another 90. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 90 minus 49, and I'll get 41. Okay, So that, that's kind of the sequence of working through those angles. My goal then is to come up with the fact that that weight is uh, going straight down and then the angle that it makes with this tangential axis is 41 degrees. Okay. So when I take cosine 41 times that uh, weight there, what I'm going to get is the component of the weight that goes along the tangential axis. So that's 10.37. That's the adjacent side, the side adjacent to the angle. So that's why cosine works for that. And then when I go sine uh, 41 times that weight, I'm going to get the component on the uh, uh, normal axis. And that's the 9.01. So that, that's what I'm doing here. I'm kind of working through those angles so I can do the trig and break that weight down into components is what I want to do. And that's 13.73 newtons. Okay. So that's what I'm up to there. So the result of that is the sketch you see in the lower right. It's everything kind of broken up and, and all the trig done before I do any of the equations. Okay. I don't have to do it that way, but I just did, you know, for whatever reason. So, so we good with that? So, so that's kind of the, the important step here to, to start with, is to get that picture. And again, once I got that picture, I don't care, you know, whether that thing's going on a curve or not. I don't care if it's on the moon. I don't care if it's in a mine. I don't care if it's on a tram in the Alps. It doesn't make any difference anymore. It's just a box with arrows on it. That's all I care, and I just do F equals MA. And I put the dynamic stuff on the left. And I put the static stuff on the right. Oh, I needed to do one other step here. I need to find that normal acceleration. Okay. So, uh, which is V squared over R. And that'll go in the uh, normal direction. And then I've got that uh, force diagram drawn up. And then again, it's just a matter of writing up F equals MA equations in the two different directions. So the circular stuff, I generally tend to orient it on the normal and tangential axes. Not always. There's some exceptions to that. But generally speaking, that's, that's my first option. That's what I think about doing. All right. So FN equals MAN. I'm going to call that N the positive direction. I got Fn and 9.01 for the forces, and I got the 9.52 for the acceleration. Yeah, question there. Why is the 9.01 down instead of 
when is it down? Um, so why is the 9.01 down? Um, okay, what, I'm, what I've got is I've got a, a, uh, a vector that I'm starting with, which I'm showing there in blue. So that's this one. And what I'm going to do is do the trigonometry to break that thing up you know, into the legs of the triangle, like what I do with right angle trig. So my legs are here and there. I just move that over here, you know. Just, so it's down. So the 9.01, the, the weight is straight down. So when I calculate the 9.01, sine 41 times the weight, I get this component going down left to match. It's in the same direction. Um, well, I don't know if I'm assuming it's positive so much as the fact I'm using that vector, the 13.73, to generate the two right angle components. The 13.73 the is down, you know, so, so the components are too. So we're good with that. We're about out of time, I think, but... We'll finish up these equations next time, I guess. All right.